and welcome to Linguistics After Dark. I'm Sarah. I'm Eli. And I'm Jenny. If you've got a question about language and you want experts to answer it without having done any research whatsoever, we're your podcast. Settle in, grab a snack or a drink, and enjoy. I am excited for this month's episode. I always want to say week, but we don't do weekly. We do monthly. Vaguely. We definitely do not do weekly. I mean, it's like this week, which is part of this month. I don't know. I mean, because we also could say today's episode, but like we don't do one every day. I guess that's true. I mean, I feel like there's something involving like Gracie and Maxims here. Like, I feel like mm-hmm. this is a maxim of quantity kind of thing. I guess I just am so used to like other podcasts or TV episodes being weekly that it, I have to remind myself that it's like, oh no, we actually can only do this once a month <laughs> because we all have jobs. <laughs> yes true um are the two of you excited about any language things lately i'm excited about all of the language things all the time yeah i feel like the better question is are there language things we're not excited about oh that's an interesting like uno reverse card is there any language (laughs) thing that we're not excited about i mean there's gotta be it's such a broad field what are Wow, I'm trying to think, like, what are linguistic things that I actually haven't been interested in learning? I was reading, actually, through some of our old chat logs um, when we were preparing for the first, like, panel that started this whole thing. Uh Uh-huh. I was reading through some of the old chat logs a couple nights ago, and apparently I had gone on a, like, Linguistics 101 YouTube binge because there was so much stuff outside of my, like, narrow focus areas that I had completely forgotten (laughs) and apparently I got to theta roles and (laughs) got about 20 seconds into that video and said hmm that's nice and noped right out of there oh man theta roles we're gonna have to do a thing of the day one time that is theta roles yes or someone could ask us about them uh hey ling 101 students ask us about theta roles and then decide if you want to be a linguistics major (laughs) (laughs) Eli can talk about them because I'm gonna hide under a blanket. I mean, I can also not talk about those at all. Like, I can vaguely talk about them, but theta roles are like one of those things that is in this weird in between where there are some linguists who like really truly still use them, and there are a bunch of linguists who are like, we left theta roles behind in the 70s. It's 2020. Get on the train. Like, what are we using instead? Oh, man, I so many different things. I don't know. Okay. Maybe semantics is dead. I don't... Who knows? <laughs> semantics is dead. Long live semantics. I guess, yeah. I mean, theta, lambda, they're both Greek letters. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, shall we learn a language thing that isn't theta rolls? Oh my god, can we please? It <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, okay, so I have a classic for us today. Uh, I, I'm excited about this. Uh, I know the two of you are excited about this because if anybody has looked at our logo and they've seen a little bird thing and they're like, what is that? I'm here to bring you the gospel of the Wug. Yeah. yeah. Wug. Uh, it's spelled W-U-G and it is uh, sort of an unofficial mascot of linguists uh, ever since a pivotal role that it played uh, in a study and a paper by a linguist, a fantastic linguist named Jean Burko Gleason. Um, The paper is called The Child's Learning of English Morphology. um, And it is all about how kids learn to generalize language things. Um, So this is also a sneaky way of talking a little bit about acquisition and about like regular forms and so on. Um, But I'm going to ask both of you some questions cool. uh feel free to jump in right at the end uh either one of you here we go okay uh okay so i know a man who knows how to spow he is in all likelihood right now spowing and he did the same thing yesterday what did he do yesterday yesterday he spowed spowed all right uh i also know a man who zibs what do you think a man who zibs is called? A zib man. A zibber. Ah, interesting. We're going to come back to that in a second. 
So uh, this is a niz who owns a hat. Whose hat is it? The niz's hat. And now there are two nizzes and they both own hats. Whose hats are they? They are the niz's hats. Or the niz's hats. Hmm. Uh, and then, of course, there is the the big one, which is, uh, and this is basically how a lot of these this test was done, is that they got some kids or a kid and uh, showed them a picture of this little blue bird and said, this is a wug, and then showed them a picture of two of these blue birds and said, this is another one. Now there are two of them. There are two... Wugs. Wugs. Yes. So... Uh, we have wug and wugs. We have uh, spowing and spowed. We have uh, zibber or zibman is really interesting because zibman is sometimes given instead of zibber. And nice. it's a way to tell. I didn't break it. <laughs> no, um, although you might be a preschooler. <laughs> um, it's a way to tell whether the kid has acquired the dash er agentive suffix yet mm. um and there are some other cool ones there's uh like um talking about how compound words came to be so like why is a birthday called a birthday or like why is sunshine called sunshine um and those represent being able to diagnose stages of development where like really young kids will say a birthday is called a birthday because you get presents rather than a birthday is called a birthday because it's the day of your birth. Mm. <laughs> um, or like, why is breakfast called breakfast? And being able to determine that it's break fast, like break the fast of, of the night versus like it's called breakfast because that's when you get eggs. Right. <laughs> cool. Yeah. But there's also a little bit more, which is like, if I were to say, uh, this is a frack. Now there are two of them. There are two... Fracks. Right. So in that case, you pluralize with s instead of z, which is what you pluralize with wugs. And so you can also test that uh, kids have learned to uh, assimilate the plural morpheme and use s or z or is, uh, as in nizzes. So that's, that's the wug test. Um, and it's a whole bunch of these different tests, but everybody remembers the wugs because they're the cutest ones. They are the cutest ones. So I have two things to add on to this. One is when I was taking my morphology class and we talked about this and we talked about the types of morphemes like the plural S or Z or whatever sound it is that are very productive and like you can add them to pretty much anything. And then there's also the types that like you know, we make child into children and you can't really pluralize things with run most of the time in English, unless you're being silly. But anyway, um, my professor always wanted to call that morphological productivity, which is totally fine. But I just want to state for the record that we are missing out on a great opportunity to use the phrase wugability or to use the term wugability or wuggable. Wugability is definitely better. Yeah, I have heard people use wuggable right. to so mean morphologically productive. Right, so I would just like to productive. encourage all of you Ling 101 students and all of the rest of you, get rid of the phrase morphological productivity. It's boring. Wuggable. That's the true gospel here. Is this the official position of Linguistics After Dark? This is definitely the official position of Linguistics After Dark. Yes. Yeah, we don't take geopolitical stances, but absolutely wuggable should take over morphological productivity. Yes. Excellent. Um, the other fun thing that I want to add to this is you can do these tests in every language and you can do them with all kinds of different morphemes and different kinds of language acquisition stuff. And um, some other people, not Jean Burko Gleason to the best of my knowledge, but some other linguists did a similar test to this in German. And in the same way that English uses ed as the kind of like most wuggable past tense suffix. There is a most wuggable past tense suffix in German. And it is the least common past tense marker by token <laughs> in German. Huh. So when you, there's like 
I don't know how many, I don't speak German, but there's like, say, nine or ten past tense patterns. And the quote unquote regular one, the most wuggable one of all of them, is the smallest by number of words that use it, which I just think is hilarious. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, you can actually do a little bit of that in English because we have the strong verb pattern or the mm -hmm. like Germanic consonant vowel consonant <laughs> pattern um so there were actually a couple of these tests um that uh Jean Burke Gleason did in her thing and I I didn't use them up top because I wanted to be sure of getting the right answers from the two of you uh <laughs> which is not scientifically sound methodology uh but is okay for a podcast uh but it is stuff like oh this stone franks yesterday this stone frank frank right right so like there is this like this uh ablaut thing that happens mm -hmm. that i think most english speakers would be inclined to do if the verb follows that consonant vowel consonant pattern mm -hmm. um in the same morphology class actually um we were talking about that whole ablaut thing and how it is a pattern that English speakers recognize. And I believe in that test, they found that English speakers were more likely to do like frink to frank if not only it was the consonant vowel consonant, but especially if it had an ing or an ink ending. Um, mm. And also, especially if the action denoted by that nonsense word was in any way similar to another word so like the example that my professor gave was someone um taking a glass of water and like tossing it back really fast and that was schlinking and because that's similar to drink people were more likely to say schlank than schlinked and he also pointed out that we have other irregular quote on well the ablo pattern is not necessarily irregular but we do have other words that have a more irregular past tense that you're not likely to see wugged in that way so he also pointed out that blink mm -hmm. um you get blinked and it could have been blank but it's not think you get thought and where you might accidentally or especially as a kid, you might assume that blank is, or blunk is the past tense of blink. Uh, I distinctly remember my professor saying, you are never in your life going to accidentally say, I blot, <laughs> to mean that yesterday I blinked. I was like, hmm, true. Yeah, the, the thing that I was going to bring up is that um, you actually have this interesting variation right now between two past tenses of sneak Mm -hmm. You have sneaked and snuck, and we don't do research, but I actually think snuck is newer than sneaked. I think sneaked huh. is the actual original past tense, and that um, the ablaut is so wuggable in that pattern that people have started to say snuck, and it seems fine. You also get yeet and yacht, or yeet and yote. Yes. Yes. All of the past tenses of yeet are the best. Yeah. Agreed. I, so that's like, it. I don't think that there is a verb that it particularly patterns on, but people are aware of this ablaut change. And again, you have this consonant, vowel, consonant, uh, like, like strong movement-oriented mm -hmm. verb. And so, like, yes, you do hear yeeted, but I think uh, I have... I have, and yeet is playful also, which I think encourages people to be a little more playful with the morphology. Yes. So you get yote or yacht. I have heard yeeted, but exclusively when followed by someone else shouting whoever set it down and being like, no, it's yote or yacht or whatever. Like I've never heard it, I've never heard yeeted used uncontested. Oh, I've heard that. Also, can I just share my favorite example of 
I guess it's sort of luggability, but it's an anecdote about my baby brother, who a couple of years ago was hanging out behind the couch, like between the couch and the window, bouncing. And he said, hey, Jenny, ask me what I'm doing. I was like, what are you doing? And he said, I'm jamping. Jamping? Yes, it's a word I made up. It's the plural of jumping. <laughs> <laughs> That's adorable. What does the plural of jumping entail? <laughs> uh, jumping repeatedly. That's adorable. Doesn't, doesn't Russian have a thing where they have motion verbs that you change the morphology of if you are doing them once versus repeatedly versus like in a temporal circularly manner? I'm sure um, ASL does that. American Sign Language. Mm. Jamping. Jamping. Spelled like jumping, but with an A instead of a U. Perfect. One of the other cases of wuggable things that has happened yeah, fairly recently. No, I actually guess it would have been a while ago. Another case of a wuggable word was when the Toyota Prius came out mm. and people started to try to figure out how to pluralize it because I think we are influenced by the dash US Latin thing um, to turn dash US into dash A um, or into dash I. Um, and also, I think people were just like, Priuses sounds weird. Mm -hmm. So I, I remember the Toyota had a contest, actually. And I think the winner was Pri-I. But I think... <laughs> Also, that has settled down, and I think people now just kind of do whatever nonce form they think works best. Yeah. Um, I'm also very fond of the Latinate I plural um, on words that end with an S but not a U-S. So a family that we were friends with when I was growing up, their last name ended with L-E-S-S, -S, and we never called them the last namelesses. We always called them the last name lie, uh, <laughs> even though, like, literally no one in any actual language that we speak pluralizes ESS to I, but we just do that all the time because it was funny. Oh, yeah. I've heard of, like, uh, the plural of Kansas is Kansai. <laughs> <laughs> How have I never heard that? That's delightful. That's also, fantastic. why do you need plural Kansas, Kansai? I mean, there was that beam with two Ohio's. True. Maybe we will have many Kansa. Because I feel like it, it should be Kansa rather than Kansai. Mm. That does sound more natural. You're right. We should just do a whole thing at some point of like all of the plurals. All the plurals. All of them. Like there was Walrus. that meme with all the different plurals sitting at different lunch tables and you had to like tag yourself which lunch table would you sit at. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Look for that on our Instagram story. Yes, I'll have to find it, but um, anyway, we should just like do a thing about plural. Anyway, okay. Yes. So that's the WUG test, uh, which is basically, WUGs are basically the unofficial mascot of linguistics, I think. Um, you can get lots of stuff with WUGs on them. If you want a thing that has a WUG on it, you should go get it from Jean Burko Gleason because she sells WUG things and she invented it and should get credit for it. Yes. Um, but WUGs are cool. Wugs are the best. Please don't sue us for our logo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So we are going to move on to real language questions submitted by real listeners. Um, if you want to send us a question, please do. Email it in text to questions at linguisticsafterdark.com or send us an audio recording of you speaking your question aloud, especially if you are asking about phonology or accent or I say something one way and my friend says it the other way. Send it to us so we can hear it and play it for our listeners. And speaking of questions, we are well on our way to the Lawyers After Dark special episode goal on Patreon. So uh, help us get there sign up for our Patreon and uh, also start sending us some questions for drunk law students to answer because uh, they are teed up and ready to go. I'm so excited for that. That's going to be great. Become a patron. Get your friends to be patrons. Let's find out about the law. Okay. Question number one. 
Bex asks via Slack, are clicks consonants or something else special? If something else, what differentiates them from consonants? Am I obligated to answer this phonology question? You are definitely obligated to answer this phonology question. Oh, shoot. Now I'm like on the spot. I'm going to say what I think is true, and I hope I'm right. Um, we don't do research. That's true. Uh, as far as I'm aware, they are consonants because the options are vowel and not vowel. And they are <laughs> not a vowel. So there's vowel, which is all of the vowels. They're secretly the same thing. They're a mess. We don't talk about them. We talk about them a lot. Uh, yeah, all vowels are secretly the same vowel. Th this is the other Linguistics After Dark official take. Yes. Vowels are a hot mess and words are fake. Yes, um, yep. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yep, those are our official Linguistics After Dark stances. But clicks are not vowels. Right, clicks are not vowels. So we have vowels, which are a hot mess, and we're not talking about them. And then we have consonants, which break into, uh, I'm going to say four, maybe, groups. So there's the clicks. There's the ingressives, which are not super common worldwide, as far as I remember. Uh, which are made by, like, inhaling and touching your tongue or your throat to something. Uh, and I actually can't make those sounds because I don't know how. Did you did you never do that thing as a kid where you tried to speak both on your exhale and on your inhale? Oh, I did, and I was terrible at it. Same. Would you like to demonstrate for us? <laughs> I guess I, I'm <laughs> on the spot now, aren't I? Yes. Uh, do I have to? Okay. <laughs> uh, um, uh I don't know. I guess that when I was a kid, I, I can't even do it. I, <laughs> I've trained myself out of it. Yeah. All right, listeners, hit up Google for that one. Um, <laughs> so there's ingressives, there's clicks, there's, I guess, is egressives the name for the kind of normal ones that we use in English? Man, uh, I don't know if there is a name or for them. Or it's just the default category that may or may not have a name i don't know uh and then there's also adjectives which are like like the normal ones but very forceful and you actually like kind of cough as you say them almost i don't know i'm bad at those two so that's like that's different than like an aspirated version of a consonant it's like it's like even more it's because aspiration has to do with like the timing between between sound and voicing right yeah and this is more like the force of the breath well uh yeah aspiration also it doesn't have to be with voicing because you can aspirate like a t that has no voicing but yeah it's like how not just how forcefully you stop the air in your mouth so if you say like t or k you can be like t or k actually is that adjective is that what i'm doing i mean I would tell you to go look it up. But we don't but do we that. Don't do research. Anyway, okay. So there's four kinds of consonants. Ingressive and adjective are things we know exist and are not good at reproducing. Please look them up. Uh, there's the kind that has a name that we don't know because we didn't research that either. And there's clicks, which is what you asked about in the first place. Um, and clicks are different from those other types of consonants because they are not made with the air coming in and out of your lungs but they are just made by clicking your tongue or your lips against each other and creating vibration that way the two that i'm actually well actually no i guess there's three that i can do and i never remember which one corresponds to which symbol but there's the one of like what english speaking children often learn like a chicken does like and then there's one that like i think we kind of sometimes spell in english as like tsk like and then there's everyone's favorite bilabial click, which is just smacking your lips together, like. But so there's is there one for every place of articulation, like with um, like with the yes. nameless group of consonants, you basically have a stop that you could make at every place of articulation in the mouth. So is there a click at every place of articulation? Um, I don't think there's one at every place of articulation. I guess a glottal click would take some real <laughs> muscular control, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, I just made one, like, not glottal, but a little bit in front of that. Like a so, pharyngeal yes. click or something? Yes, I think there are clicks 
there's at least five because there's the three that I can make reliably and there's two more that I know exist and don't know how to differentiate them from the three that I can make. Um, so yeah, there's there's several different ones uh, at various points forward and back in your mouth. And because they're not in English, we can't really tell the difference between them. Yeah, especially not in the middle of a word. Like it's very easy <laughs> yeah. to differentiate sounds when you're just sitting here going because like those sound different but when they are in a word with other words and sounds around them it's a lot harder i mean it's that's like in the same way that you might sit there trying to distinguish between like right you know yeah or like in a vacuum i can distinguish between um yeah, I don't know. I actually distinguish most things is the problem. <laughs> well, you actually, are... No. In a vacuum, I can distinguish between Mary, Mary, and Mary. And in real life, I can hear the difference, but I almost never produce Mary like a wedding and Mary like a person's name separately. I usually say those both as Mary. And my husband separates all three of those very distinctly and loves to give me grief for it. Actually, that's a really good way to figure out whether you have the Mary, Mary, Mary merger, which I don't, I don't think I have, but I also, whenever I say the name of the merger, I just say the same word three times because I don't <laughs> know what order I'm saying them in. Um, but I guess if you say the boy's name, Aaron, and the girl's name, Aaron, Oh, you did say those differently. Wow. I have a cousin whose name is Aaron, spelled with A's. And when I was a kid and I learned that there was another way to spell Aaron, I used to, I thought it was the funniest thing ever to tell him that his name was actually E-R-I-N. And zero people, including him, found this either offensive or funny or worth noting in any capacity. (laughs) (laughs) But I would just say it over and over, hoping to get a rise out of him, and no one cared. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I say both of those names, Aaron, Aaron, like the same as air that you breathe. Mm-hmm. And I heard Eli say Aaron, the same way that my husband says, like, get married. And then so, Aaron, the same way that he would say Merry Christmas. So I have, I have a cousin, and I have a stepbrother, and they both are men and they both have a name that's spelled a-a-r-o-n because they are from different places one of them is named aaron and the other is named aaron oh my god i could only barely hear that difference that's amazing that's so funny because one of them has the merger and the other doesn't that's (laughs) delightful that's so good all right so clicks are consonants also there are vowels which are fake also there are tones which we're not going to talk about One last thing about clicks first. Um, As with most sounds, clicks can exist in languages where you don't think they exist as what we call like paralinguistic. Is that what it's called? I don't know where you're going with this. Like like sounds or or gestures that you use that aren't part of words, but they are communicative. Oh, yeah. Okay. So like, yeah, paralinguistic. Yeah. So clicks actually, like I was saying in English, are super, uh, are like a paralinguistic thing, because you can like, at somebody if you're disappointed in them, or like. Yeah, it has a, it has a specific meaning too, right? right? Like, like if somebody's going, like they're either disappointed in you, or they are calling over a cat. Yes, (laughs) right. Um, And, um, and English uses tone, like rising and falling tone on vowels for sentence structure um where other languages use it for word structure um so people often think of clicks as these really unfamiliar like interesting sounds that we know we don't use and how can you communicate with them and it turns out that actually we communicate with them even in english pretty frequently and there's probably sounds in english that other people other language users are like what is that sound? Why is it happening? And maybe they use it sort of paralinguistically as well. Cool. Uh, Moving on to the next question. Claudia asks via email, 
Why do people love some words and hate others? Is it the sound, the denotation or the connotation of the word, or a mix of the two? Uh, most lists of prettiest and grossest words have the same few crop up every time, so clearly there's some consensus regarding what makes a word good or bad. Is it just subjective, or is there logic behind it? Yes. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. I mean, I feel like it, like there's not a hard yes or no to any of that. I think it's yes, some of all to like the, like each of the individual bits of that question, mm-hmm. including the why do bit. The answer is also yes to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's a combination of the sounds we associate with the denotation and connotation of words. And so people will think that it's the, like, the sounds themselves, and it's actually more influenced by the word, like, the word's meaning than you might assume. Although I have done no research, so I cannot actually back that up with any facts, but that seems like a probable thing that I suspect is true. I think some of it might be societal also. Yeah. Um, Fair warning, we're going to say the M word. So (laughs) if that is a thing that you can't stand, skip forward and miss this question. Um, But I I do think that there is a little bit of a phenomenon of like people finding out that words are like a gross word or a a word that people don't like and then adopting that, right? Mm -hmm. But there's also this thing where a lot of food writers have gotten into this conundrum where the word moist is the only way to describe a certain kind of texture in a baked good. Yes. Like, you don't want to say damp. You don't want to say wet. I don't want wet. damp cake. Right, exactly. Nobody wants a... I don't want a... damp cake. Right. So, but what you want is you want, like, a nice, like, moist crumb on your muffin or whatever... Uh, linguistics after dark, everyone. Uh, um, you want, you know, and you can't, you can't not use that word because there is, it's a term of art. It's a piece of jargon for food writing. Uh, so for people who really do yeah. have an aversion to the word moist must really, really hate that. But I think that if you are fine with it in the context of describing baked goods or, you know, other appropriate food items, then... Um, it, that really does go to show that a lot of times it's contextual. I'd actually be really interested yeah. to find out if there is some sort of correlation between, like, where you learn it or how you learn it being related to whether or not it bothers you. Because I feel like my primary association with the word is in food contexts, baked goods, And it doesn't particularly bother me. And I wonder if, like, making any guesses about causation, because maybe people who mind it don't go into, like, food writing contexts, or maybe if you go into food writing contexts, even if you minded it, you learn to not as much. I don't know. But I wonder if there's some sort of correlation going on there, at least. What about some Mm -hmm. uh, really nice words? Like, there's that... Was it C.S. Lewis who said that cellar door is supposed to be the the nicest sounding phrase in the English language, although he probably said it with a British accent, so with one of the many British accents. <laughs> uh what are what are your favorite or your like nicest sounding words? I have no idea. I've never thought about that before. I really like shimmer. Hmm. Like, I feel like that's just a very pleasant combination of sounds. Yeah, I dig that. I was going to say glimmer. <laughs> um, ah. But for a slightly, I mean, because I do like how it sounds, but also because it gives me a chance to talk about the thing that actually popped to mind when I read this question, um, which is some of it is, I mean, it, I think it all is subjective, but interestingly, there is this pattern um, I think in many languages, but definitely in English, of things called phonest themes, which is like P H O N E S T H E M E S, phonest themes, which are not phonemes because they're bigger than a single sound, but they're not 
morphemes either. They don't inherently carry a meaning, but they kind of do. Um, so, like, gl, gl, especially at the start of a word, is one of the most iconic ones, where we have all these words like glimmer and glisten and gleam and glow. Glow, glint. Glint. And... Even glean to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And you can't take the gl off those words and get other words. Like, int doesn't mean something, and then glint makes it the shiny version of that. Immer doesn't mean something, and then glimmer is the shiny version of that. But you do sort of get this, like, glimmer shimmer thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Or, like, even worse... If you take the GL off of glow, you get ow. (laughs) Very different. Um, And like glowing is not like the shiny version of being in pain. (laughs) Let's not interrogate that too far. But the like gl, um, even though inherently by itself, like a glove isn't shiny. There's nothing shiny about that. Like gloom is not shiny it's actually the opposite of shiny but somehow there's still this kind of idea that especially if you have gl and then a high vowel a high front vowel like an e or an e or an i that like it for whatever reason in english kind of like makes you think about sparkles and there's definitely other ones of those too that's just the one that i remember but I would imagine that there is also some level of that type of thing playing into what words people do and don't find appealing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there is actually a set of linguistic tests and phenomena that are associated with this that are sometimes called the boo-boo and kiki tests or shapes that involves matching made-up words to shapes, uh, and it involves... Uh, showing a test subject uh, a shape that is sort of like roundish, kind of like a cloud almost, uh, and a shape that is like very angular and spiky, and saying uh, one of these is kiki and one of these is boo boo. Assign like which do you think is boo boo and which do you think is kiki? And uh, the overwhelming majority of people put boo boo with the more roundy one and kiki with the more spiky one. And uh, that phenomenon is sometimes called sound symbolism, where we think of this, uh, you know, these like uh, uh, devoiced stops as more spiky or rough, that kind of thing, um, and this kind of uh, more voiced. Uh, I mean, B is a B is a stop, but um, you know, you get fricatives and stuff that end up being more roundy symbolic things yeah do we know like i don't remember the reading i've done on that well enough do we know whether it has more to do with the vowels or the consonants because like i know vowels are fake but my initial assumption would have been that it had more to do with the vowels than the consonants and i can imagine like like you switch which way around it is. So you switch the B and you make it like one of these is BB and one of these is cuckoo or whatever. Yeah. Do you know if they did that? So my understanding is that the vowels do have an effect on it, but the consonant effect is more, is stronger than the vowel effect, if I remember correctly. Um, But that they both have discernible effects. So like, BB versus boo boo would show a, a direction, but not a, as strong um, as like BB versus Kiki. Huh. Uh, also, uh, this one I'm not gonna guess on, but I know that they have also tested this cross culturally. Um, I think I think that they found that the effect holds cross culturally, though the strength is different. But that sounds we, right. That we don't do any research, so nobody cite us. Nobody <laughs> cite us for anything, basically. You can but cite our show notes. I do actually research those. That's true. If you want to know what the actual research is, go to the show notes at linguisticsafterdark.com. Uh, do not take our verbal word for it. <laughs> yes. 
I would be remiss to let us leave this question without mentioning my favorite word, which is Caesarus. Mm. Ooh, nice. Which sounds exactly like what it is, which is like a, a small murmuring, such as might make the sound Caesarus. Murmur is also good. Oh, Murmur's yeah. Murmur's very good. Onomatopoeia, not as a word, but as a concept. Oh, uh, yeah, it's very good. You actually, you get this interesting spectrum from, like, onomatopoeia through uh, sound symbolism up to funes themes, Mm -hmm. where it's, like, on the, like, is a real word, isn't a real word spectrum, and also, like, a almost a strength of effect Mm -hmm. kind of a thing, where they're all related to each other. There's some scale happening there. Yeah, I never thought about that, but that's true. All right. Good question, Claudia. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that, w- that one was fun. All right. Um, our next question comes from Mitch via email. And he says, should this word, S-U-B-M-A-R-I-N-E-R, be pronounced submariner, as in a mariner, but under the sea, or submarine-er, as in one who submarines? I'm calling rule three on this one. Okay. <laughs> We're not answering this. Everybody, take a drink. All right. I am taking a drink of winter spiced coffee from Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> because Ooh. I'm a New Englander. <laughs> I've got a warm milk drink. Mm. With honey. It's very nice. Mm. I also have a drink made of honey. Uh, I'm drinking some homemade mead. Ooh, fancy. <laughs> made with local honey and local apples. Um, yeah. Uh, fun question, but, like, I don't know. See, I was just gonna say I vote Submariner because otherwise I'm just thinking of the Marvel Comics character Namor the Submariner. Well, I was gonna say I would lean Submariner because of the Marvel Comics character (laughs) Namor the Submariner. That's extremely valid. (laughs) Alrighty. (laughs) But... The real answer to the question is uh, Sarah is drinking Dunkin' Donuts knockoff pumpkin spice latte. Jenny is having a milk drink with honey and I'm drinking mead. Ah, but see, this is not knockoff pumpkin spice because they do have that too and it's terrible. This is just like chai but coffee. Anyway, moving on. (laughs) And I think we all learned a valuable thing today. I think that's the real takeaway from this episode. Okay. Well, since we are drinking instead of answering that question, um, let's move on to a different one, which comes from a different person named Sarah. Um, She sent us an email and said, I was skimming through a chapter of my Ling 100 textbook about gendered speaking. The chapter about gendered speaking, not the whole book. Uh, It seemed fairly outdated in its interpretation. For example, according to the book, women tend to wait in turns, using back-channeling and share-speaking time equally, whereas men seem to have a hierarchy where one speaks as much as possible while they, quote-unquote, have the floor. And then she went on to say that that doesn't really ring true with her. She thinks that doesn't match her experience. And so she wants to know what kind of differences we've noticed, if any, in people who hang out mostly with people of similar or opposite sex, or even with people of similar or varying ages. This is a good question, and it's a tough question. Any linguistic question about differences between the genders always has to make it through that, like, pop linguistics filter about Mm -hmm. things that, quote unquote, everyone knows about how the different genders speak and so on. Actually, one thing that occurred to me as I was reading out this question um, was a recent episode of Lingthusiasm, which is another fantastic podcast I'm sure we've recommended previously. But they did a episode recently about uh, like actually how to have a conversation and the different kind of conversational styles different people have. They pointed out that these two styles of like back channeling, taking turns, and kind of speaking while you have the floor and waiting to be interrupted those are two very prominent conversational styles. Um, But I don't think, and I definitely don't think that um, Gretchen and Lauren in this episode, like made the claim that these are gendered in any way, but that 
there's a level of individual personality that comes into that. There's a cultural level or like a familial level um, of what conversation style you grew up speaking. So um, I think Gretchen made a point that she is what they were calling high engagement, where she will just keep talking um, Mm -hmm. and wait for someone to interrupt her. Uh, or she'll jump in and interrupt someone to like show that she's engaged with them. She wants to contribute her part mm-hmm. to the conversation. Right. Um, whereas other people, which I think her point was not Gretchen, um, <laughs> don't do that. And they have this like high consideration style where they're going to wait for you to finish talking. They're not going to interrupt you because by letting you speak, that shows their interest. And so people who have those two different styles uh, have a really hard time talking with each other sometimes because if you're a high engagement speaker and you keep talking and you're waiting for someone to interrupt you, but they're waiting for you to finish talking because they don't want to interrupt you. Then you um, both feel like the other person isn't actually interested in the conversation. Exactly. And so interestingly, the kind of bottom line recommendation that they made was if you're in a conversation where you feel like the other person is not engaged, do the opposite of whatever your instinct is. Because if your instinct is keep talking, fill the silence, they might be waiting for some silence so they can jump in. And if your instinct is wait for someone to stop talking, don't. Because they might be waiting for you to jump in and interrupt them. Um, And the other option is, of course, if you know the person well enough, you can be like, hey, can I interrupt you? Or do you want me to let you finish? Or like, have a little bit of meta conversation about how your conversation is going. But I don't think it's specifically a gender thing. I think it's a kind of cultural thing. Yeah, I like, I am very, very strongly high engagement. And I've so I've done a little bit of research about it, like a few years ago, while I was in college and was like, why am I having so much trouble talking to these people like this? And I remember coming across those terms and having it be like, oh, this explains so much about so many conversations I've had my entire life, actually. But I've never seen it linked to gender before, only as like a cultural thing or a regional thing. Mm -hmm. See, this is very interesting because... I don't think that at its core it is a gendered thing, but a lot of the ways where I have encountered this, uh, the high engagement being a problem, um, it's not put in those terms and it's not in those guys, but it is under the idea of if you are at work and on a team where there are more men than women, um, that a lot of times you will see efforts being made or complaints being made that men talk over women or talk a lot or uh, dominate a meeting and that there is sort of a lot of advice out there or uh, exhortation out there for men in meetings to be making sure, making a conscious effort that women at the table get to talk or that they uh, are invited, like that you make explicit space or say, I haven't heard from you in a while. Is there something you want to add or does everything seem fine? And I know that personally, I have had to work to get to a place where I sort of started by saying, I have been talking a lot and now I'm going to stop uh, and have tried to pull that back explicitly. Again, I don't think that at its core, the two conversational styles are like fundamentally linked to uh, different genders, but I do think that societally and maybe my experience comes from uh, like a workplace, like Mm -hmm. a business uh, space, that there is at the very least the perception and I think the actuality there that men are seen or noticed more when they are high engagement uh, and that that can be counterproductive in those scenarios. Yeah, I would also say two things with that. One is because of certain societal prejudices and whatever, um, I think it is more likely that a high engagement woman would be seen as rude than a high high engagement man in a similar situation. Mm-hmm. Um and so then sometimes women like 
teach themselves to be less high engagement, especially in those situations. So it may not be inherently a gendered thing, but it might be a learned thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And secondly, especially in a workplace environment, if you have a group of predominantly high consideration people, it's not going to be a problem that people's ideas are not recognized because people are going to take turns and like give space for everyone to speak. If you have a group of predominantly high engagement people, on the other hand, regardless of gender, and you have one or two high consideration people, unless they learn to be more high engagement, and unless the high engagement people, like you said, learn to specifically step back and say, hey, jump in here, it's very easy for those high consideration people to get pushed aside or get spoken over um, or just not have a chance to speak. Um, And so I could definitely see where this kind of dichotomy favors the high engagement folks in a workplace environment, whereas in a one-on-one conversation, as long as both parties are like aware of what's going on, then it's fine. But in a bigger group, especially with people you don't necessarily know super well, I think the high consideration people are much more likely to be bowled over. Um, And if that like does end up tying into learned behavior or other prejudices um, aside from just like what your conversational style is, then that could amplify it. Yeah, I hadn't actually thought of it that way, but it, it makes a ton of sense. I don't know that I have ever been part of a team where the majority of people were um, high consideration, although that, again, might be people learning and adjusting themselves to be high engagement because they have found that the other style doesn't work at a workplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that. And I also, until we were answering this question, hadn't connected the terms from the Lingthusiasm episode to my workplace experience. But now I'm really glad that I have another tool to talk about those things. Um, Yeah. And also just like, I don't know, it's something, so as a high school teacher, it's something I think about a lot, like some of the metacognitive and metalinguistic vocabulary um, that we use all the time amongst teachers. You know, we talk about whether kids are able to articulate their thoughts or prove their understanding or all these different things. Um, And we don't always actually have those kind of meta conversations with the students. And that's something Hmm. that I try to do as much as I can, because I think it's really valuable to have the words to describe what you're doing, not just be able to do it. Um, And this is also a reason that there's like a whole can of worms. Please, no one actually asked me a question about this, but... um, there's a lot of tension in the language pedagogy community around different styles of teaching and the difference between acquisition and learning and teaching grammar or not teaching grammar and all this stuff. Um, But one of the reasons that I feel really strongly that we should be teaching grammar and grammatical terminology is not because I think there is one right way to do everything. We obviously talked about that last episode, but that having the terms at hand to be able to talk about what you're doing really allows you to like organize that information and access it more easily in your head. Or even if it doesn't help you access it in your own mind, it helps you communicate with other people about it if you have that metalinguistic terminology. And I think the same is true like now that I have, and like you said, now that we have this framework of high engagement versus high consideration conversations, like that's a framework you can apply to people all over your life. And you don't just have to think about it in your own head. You can be like, hey, buddy, I noticed that you don't like to jump into conversations. And I often feel like I'm talking over you. I'm going to try to step back so that you have a chance to talk. But if you notice that I'm not doing that, please don't feel like you're being rude if you interrupt me. Please interrupt me. Or vice versa, or whatever. And like that just leads to better like relationships all around. Communication all around. Maybe we ought to uh, put a Teachers After Dark episode on our docket. 
Okay. Yep. Yes. So that if somebody does send you a question about the current holy wars in ling- in uh, language pedagogy, that you could save that for uh, when we have a bunch of teachers on. Yeah. Okay. Someone <laughs> send me that question in like two years when I feel like I have a strong opinion about things. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you literally just say, like, two minutes ago, you do have a strong opinion about this? Yeah, let me rephrase that. Send me that in two years when I have a coherent understanding of my opinion. <laughs> uh, there's that uh, metalinguistic description again. Yep. You need to be able to have the language to talk about the things that you know. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a pretty thorough examination of this kind of high consideration, high engagement, waiting in turns with back channeling versus uh, holding the floor as much as possible Mm -hmm. thing. Um, Is there any other places where we wanted to go with this? Um, What kinds of differences have you noticed in people who hang out with mostly people of similar or opposite sex and even with people of similar or varying ages? Hmm. I think someone made the point before, I can't remember if it was Sarah or Jenny, but I feel like there is a, if not a register component here, then a social situational component here, Mm -hmm. where, again, you do get that high engagement, uh, hold the floor for a very long time thing, but you do also, I think act differently or are more conscious about it when you are in a casual social situation than when you're in a formal workplace scenario. I Mm -hmm. think that was what I said about I grew up with a very high engagement style talking with my family and my friends but then went to college and like was in conversations with a lot of like high consideration people and got really like kind of confused and uncertain for a while about why I felt like the way I was trying to engage in conversations wasn't right somehow anymore. But yeah, that was very much, like, it was, that was very much something that I noticed in, like, the more formal kind of settings, where it was, like, in classrooms, in office hours with professors, that kind of thing. I didn't notice the disconnect in conversational styles nearly as much just hanging out with a bunch of my friends or whatever and it didn't occur to me until I had found those terms and read some discussion of them and whatever that there was that distinction it wasn't just I talk one way with my family and people at college talk another it's also situational even at college there are situations in which a high engagement style are still normal here. Mm -hmm. I think the only other thing that has struck me in terms of like, how do people speak who hang out with different groups of people or whatever, is just that, yeah, you're going to have those register shifts and you're going to have like differences in vocabulary and I don't know, like sense of humor almost like. Yeah. um, Yeah. You're going to have a different way to have those meta conversational conversations with each other. Yep. A friend of mine, uh, we were hanging out with a whole group of friends. I think there were like six of us and two of us are high school teachers. And someone made a comment and to like totally innocent, totally offhand, like germane to the topic and everything. And um, Caroline and I just lost it because it sounded like something high schoolers say that is funny to high schoolers. (laughs) And we spend so much of our time with high schoolers that now we also follow that train of humor. And so we're sitting in this group with a bunch of late 20 somethings and she and I are cracking up over something that's like a joke for 15 year olds. (laughs) that no one else in the room has even registered as a thing. Uh, Is this a bonus of being a high school teacher? Do you get to be hip with all of the dank memes of the youth of today? Like, (laughs) yes, more than my other friends. And yet still my children say things. And I'm like, I know you're speaking English. I know you (laughs) are. (laughs) And I even know what those words mean. I just can't put them together into a sentence that has a coherent whole. 
But then I learned You realize things. once this goes out on the internet, the whole world will know that you're old. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, I, I've I've gratefully accepted that now. Okay, well, other Sarah, I hope that that answers your question. I don't know if we came to a coherent answer on it, but um, as you will learn in the rest of your Linguistics 100 class, we don't have a lot of coherent answers to a lot of these sticky questions in linguistics, which honestly is, for me, what makes it such a fun thing to study. Yeah, agreed. I mean, you may have noticed that one of our only firm official opinions is that vowels are all the same vowel which i feel like is a pretty good like that should establish what to expect in terms of firm linguistics opinions from us and also from linguistics i mean but here's the thing is i bet that there are a few phonologists who are listening to us who heard us say all vowels are the same vowel and they're like yeah that's true (laughs) there was a thing going around twitter a few weeks ago that was like quote tweet with the secret fact about your field that everyone knows but won't speak out loud for fear everything comes tumbling down and i can't tell you the number of linguists i saw who quote tweeted that and said words are fake or we don't know what (laughs) words are i was like good see that doesn't Uh. seem like an appropriate answer at all to me because i've had professors say that in linguistics classes oh yeah like that's not a secret opinion That's just one that no one else will listen to us say. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, we know what phonemes and morphemes and lexemes are. We know what constituents are. But, like, what a word is, is, like, is is not a thing. I mean, I think part of it is that words are actually, like, not nearly relevant to all of the things that linguistics wants to talk about. They're all, yeah. Like, in a weird way. Like word is the least useful chopping up of language like it's the least useful unit of language By for far. talking about language so like words are fake no one cares <laughs> and no, no one, one cares. cares uh all right let's talk about last episode's puzzler i almost said last week's puzzler again <laughs> uh, so last podcast uh we had a puzzler And that puzzler was, what do these three words have in common? And I will spell them for you. J-O-B-P-O-L-I-S-H and H-E-R-B. So uh, did either of you get the answer to this puzzler? They each got two different, like, very distinct pronunciations, one of which is a proper noun and the other of which is not. I only got to the two pronunciations. Although, I will also point out... In some dialects, people pronounce the H on herb, even if they're talking about, like, parsley and stuff. Um, Yeah, but they're wrong. Yeah. I mean, yes. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. Uh, (laughs) um, Yeah, I think the the sort of straightforward way to say it is that they change pronunciation when you capitalize the first letter. Ah, okay, cool. That's a way better, that's a way better phrasing. Yeah. Um, So, congratulations if you got it. Uh, This was a cool one um, that took me a little bit of time to to figure out. Uh, Also, if you do pronounce the H in herb when you're talking about flavorful leafy greens, like... We don't actually think you're wrong. That was a joke. You're valid. (laughs) You're Uh, wrong, but but you're valid. (laughs) (laughs) You're you're marginal. We're going to put a tiny question mark next to your... (laughs) Next to your pronunciation. Uh, no asterisk. Uh, definitely no pointing hand. Maybe a flower. What? Sorry, that's a that's an optimality theory joke. Okay. I know nothing about optimality theory, and I'm very intrigued. Yeah, I'll take uh, your word for it. <laughs> there's an optimality theory Easter egg on our website, actually. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, uh, but I'm not going to say anything else about it, because well, I don't want to talk about it optimality theory okay (laughs) anyway we found another linguistic topic we're not actually interested in uh i mean optimality theory is really interesting i just have some real strong opinions about it we'll save that for the same episode when we talk about linguistic pedagogy all right that's a deal all right Uh, well (laughs) in the meantime (laughs) no go for it go for it cool um so in the meantime i have a new puzzler Um, And actually, the opening text is exactly the same. 
what do these words have in common? Okay, not exactly the same. There's more than three. So the words are assess, banana, dresser, grammar, potato, revive, uneven, and voodoo. Uh, all right. Well, think about that puzzler. If you know the answer to it without looking it up, then fantastic. If not, you can wait for our next episode. Um, and you could always, I suppose, look it up on the internet. But that's cheating. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Linguistics After Dark is produced by m Enterprises. Audio editing is done by Eli. Question wrangling is done by Jenny. Show notes are done by me. And transcriptions are a team effort. Our music is Covert Affair by Kevin McLeod. Our show is entirely listener supported. You can help us by visiting patreon.com slash emfozzing, E-M-F-O-Z-Z-I-N-G, and by telling your friends about us. Ratings on iTunes and other podcast services help as well. Today, we want to say thanks to these awesome patrons, Jeff, Brighton, Dre, Inga, Mitch, Bex, and Tim. Find all our podcasts and show notes online at linguisticsafterdark.com or on all your favorite podcast directories. And send those questions, text or audio, to questions at linguisticsafterdark.com or tweet them at us at LXAD Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram also at LXAD Podcast. And until next time, if you weren't consciously aware of your tongue in your mouth, now you are. You know, yar. Walk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, war. <laughs> Sitting here going. Ah, I put on chapstick. Sorry, there's a weird bug on the bed, and I'm trying to make sure it's not about to crawl on me, but it kind of is. Okay. All right. You should eat, eat that bug far away. No, because then I'd have to touch it. Do bugs feel fear? I, I mean, don't know. This isn't Biology After Dark. I don't know if we... That's a whole different podcast, by the way, is Biology After Dark. They're all words that Dan Quayle spelled with an E on the end of them. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to cut that joke because it's... <laughs> old? <laughs> because it's old. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to be your neighborhood linguistics bar.